recording. Boom, here we go. So today is the refresher of NLP, uh, master level NLP. And so, you know, when you think about master level NLP, well, first, it, and why are we doing the refresher, if you will? It's to jumpstart your skills. Um, because if we've been in lockdown, if you've been kind of slowed down, things like that, it's always good to jumpstart your skills. And one of the things we'll stress today, or I'll stress, at the master level, you start looking for real world examples of the change work that you want to do, you know? So if you're working with a client, we'll get to this, that, uh, oh yeah, I could put the PowerPoint in the, in the uh, before the end, I'll put the PowerPoint in the chat and you can all download it. Uh, whoever sent me that, thank you. Um, but if you look for real world examples of somebody who's trying to make a change, if you could find something in their life that you can use, it makes it more fun. We'll have some play time and then we'll answer questions, problems, things like that. Let's have some fun with this. I, I, I had a great time yesterday. And I know a lot of my uh, trainers have been doing refreshers and intros and things like that. So that's one reason I decided to jump in and do it, just to do mine. And always challenge yourself. So here, jump starting your skills, if you will. So, you know, so what are some of the beliefs about the master level of NLP, which I call waking hypnosis? The basic level are the are all the techniques. You practice your rapport skills. You gather your info. You mirror your match. Then you do your techniques, whether it's the visual squash, do behavior generator, swish pattern, uh, six step reframe. We could go, you know, yes, no, magic mirror. The the basic techniques you know, which are pretty easy because, <clears throat> you know, they come like this. There's a little, you can read them and they work, right? So what is the master level? Well, the master is when you can do it without formally doing it. That's the biggest part. And use a lot of waking hypnosis. So why don't people do it more? Well, there's a, they believe it's hard to do or it's tricky. Also, some people have a belief set that it's manipulative or underhanded. If you're using waking hypnosis and covert hypnosis with someone, right? Um, because you're kind of doing it with or without their, you know, you, you got implied consent, but you haven't done like a, a, a technique. So some people have that, right? Uh, a lot of people think there's a lot of rules to it, right? And the other big thing I see people run into, even at the basic level with hypnosis or NLP, is you start thinking the fallacy of knowledge. You start thinking everyone knows what you know. So I, you know, I, I don't want to do that because they all know this, right? And it's not true. Not true at all. Uh, you have a skill set that's unique. If you've taken basic NLP and basic hypnosis, you know more than a lot of people, right? And you assume certain people have it. A lot of people in our field, hypnosis and NLP, will assume like psychiatrists and psychologists know all about this stuff, right? I know Albert's a psychologist on the call. I think we got a couple others. I think we got a medical doctor. You know, I can guarantee you, right? They do not have any idea what this is unless they've went out of their way to learn it, right? I always say I sum it up with uh, when I was a just getting started and I was talking to a psychiatrist now called Drugs Treatment Center and I mentioned hypnosis and NLP. He says, well, wow, that stuff doesn't work. And I went, doctor, what do you mean? Why, why won't it work? He goes, well, if it worked, I'd know about it. And I said, well, how would you know about it if you hadn't taken a class? He goes, well, I would just know. You know, they'd have taught it to me in medical school. Of course, he was a arrogant young psychiatrist. Uh, and he thought MD stood for a uh, minor deity, you know, and that he, that, you know, if he didn't know it, it wouldn't work, right? And he wasn't going to go learn it. That was the other thing, you know? So anyway, that's why people kind of have some issues with it. Why do people develop these issues? Well, there's a natural tendency to think the skill is hard, is hard to master. I, I posted a thing yesterday is that, you know, about, you know, we think things are difficult. We don't try things because we think they're difficult, but they're difficult because we don't try them, you know? And what we want to do is realize until you do it, you don't know whether it's hard or not. A lot of us have done things and other people tell us how hard it is to do, but you didn't know when you did it. Thank God you didn't know when you did it, right? And here's a big one, and I don't back off from this. There's a lot of damn NLP and hypnosis teachers that want to appear smart, you know, the ones that come across as condescending, know-it-alls, things like that. But they, and one way they do that, they make it confusing and they set rules. You know, maybe my, my 
vehemence comes out when I describe this because I was around when NLP was getting started. There was no levels, ladies and gentlemen. There was no basic level, master level, or trainer level. You just kind of took an NLP class. And if they liked you and you hung around, you started teaching NLP. That was how it worked. Going back to the hypnosis world, there was very, very little training. People just started doing it. You know, I remember asking uh, Orman McGill about it. How did he, where did he learn hypnosis? He goes, well, he just read about it and started doing it, right? Uh, same with some other people in our field. Gil Boyne, <clears throat> the late Gil Boyne, just like the late Orman McGill. They just started doing it. So, you know, that's one of my things. But teachers want to appear smart, so we'll make it tough, condescending. They'll have a lot of rules. One of the things we'll talk about today, you know, there's one guy who's got like 36 questions and rules to use a certain thing. And I'm like, it's not that complicated, right? Uh, and, and I think this, a lot of this comes from not understanding the basic rules of advanced NLP and no, no real knowledge of how it works, right? And thinking there's a separate set of rules for master level. And, uh, you know, uh, and so first thing I want to talk about real quick, because this is kind of a background to it. You know, we've, a lot of us, probably all of us have heard about, you know, the four levels of learning, you know, <clears throat> unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, conscious competence, and then unconscious competence. Great. You know, you don't know what you don't know is at the base level. And then, you know, you don't know something and then you learn something. So you know it, but it takes conscious effort to do it and then unconscious competence when you know it and you don't even have to think about it anymore and so we all go through these levels when we're learning anything i could i always use the example of driving a car when you're a little kid you don't even know you don't know how to drive even though there's cars in your world you get in the car with your parents or other people and so you know it but you don't really even think about it so you don't know you don't know and then there comes a time that you know you don't know how to drive this is a decision point. Do I want to learn how to drive, right? You could say no, and you don't learn how to drive. Um, some of us on the call are old enough to remember when computers were first getting started and everything like that. They're, I don't want to learn that. I don't want to learn that, right? Unfortunately, there's some organizations that kind of have that thought, but let's not go down that path. Um, but you could learn it or not learn it, you know? And this is where we look back and go, damn, I wish I'd have jumped into internet marketing in 1995. You know, like my dear friend, Joe Vitale, right? Um, but you, you either learn or don't learn. But then when you learn it, you have to think about it. Like when you first learn to drive, your hands are 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, you're having to think about it. When you first learn your computer skills, you're, you're very careful. And then if you practice it, it becomes second nature. You're just driving your car. You're not thinking about it. You're just do, 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 right? Great. This is good. Because once you get to that unconscious competent level, you can multitask. You really can multitask, but there's some drawbacks, right? Unconscious competence has serious drawbacks, right? Because whatever mistakes you learn in the program become set in the program. So if you have a, what's the word I want? If you have like a, a, a malfunction in your driving it, and it becomes unconscious, you will always do it, right? Those of us that are old enough to remember, now I'll really date myself, you didn't have to buckle your seatbelt when you got in a car, right? It was, right? And, it, and then, so we had to learn how to make it consciously competent as opposed to people that once they learned, like when my daughter learned how to drive, it was a rule, so she had to buckle up at the beginning, right? So you had, you know, so it's just the way that it is, you know? Um, so once you fall into unconscious competence, things become locked in. Right. By the way, I still love the, was it two years ago? I got a ticket for driving my truck with my seatbelt unbuckled. Okay, fine. Okay. I was wrong. But what was funny, I got the ticket from a motorcycle cop. Right. And I asked him, I go, do you see any like <laughs> disconnect between your, I drive a motorcycle. There's no seatbelt on a motorcycle. And he goes, yeah, some rules are stupid, but it's the law here. <laughs> here's your, here's your ticket. Anyway, so, but you don't think about what you're doing. So things slip by, right? Including things you, when you're first learning to drive, you might not, you would notice, you would, you would take into account, right? Now, when it's automatic, you just go, right? It's like, 
whatever it is. Same with your computer training, whatever it is that you do. Same with your hypnosis and NLP training. You default to your own old model, right? You default yesterday, hope you're on the call. We talked about hot, the hot model of, of, of NLP and hypnosis, hierarchy of thought. When you're in level one, you're in the experience, you're not thinking about it. You're do, 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 do. That's what happens, right? And so you default to your old training. My evidence for this, for most of us to learn hypnosis, whatever hypnotic induction you learned first that you really like, that's probably to this day your default uh, induction. If you were trained by people that do the progressives, there's that you still like progressive. If you were trained, you know, one of Jerry's kids, going back to Jerry Kine, you probably like the Dave Elman. Uh, uh, you know, if you were trained by Gil Boyne back in the day, you like rapids, you know, hand the hand pull and all this other stuff. If you've been trained by all of them, you you can use them all, but you still have a default that you go to, you just do right. And now the good news of that, you're, you become excellent at whatever the default is. The bad news is it kind of makes you one dimensional, right? You do the same thing for everything. And you can be very, very good, but you'll never be great, right? And it's that first exposure paradox. The first exposure is the most powerful, right? First person that taught you NLP or hypnosis, first person that did this. That first one's kind of powerful because you're a blank slate at that point. One of the few things psychology did get right is sort of the tabula russa thing. Uh, and so you're being imprinted, even though it, you could be an adult, you don't know anything about hypnosis, and boom, that first exposure becomes your default, right? So you have to reset your skills, right? So what do elite actors, athletes do different than uh, could be very good actors and athletes, right? What do they do different? What do the elite ones do different, right? Well, the truly elite ones realize raw talent can actually stop you from being great, right? I always think of sports. You don't even have to be a sports fan, but, you, but if you are, it's easier. We always see these people, they go, they have all the talent in the world, right? Oh, their bar is high, you know? Uh, the sport I follow, and, and you know, it, it don't, I only follow two sports anymore, MMA and, Mar and uh, football. But, you know, they always talk about they'll draft a guy because he has such talent. This, this talent transfer into greatness, you know? Uh, unrewarded talent is, is common. You know, unrewarded genius is, you know, there's a lot of geniuses sleeping under bridges, as they say, right? It can stop you from being great because you don't have to try. You don't have to try, right? And you see it like actors uh, also do it. They, def you know, I've heard it said the curse of an early hit in theater or film, because that, you know, you become Johnny Depp doing um, actors, uh, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean for the next 25 years, you know? And I say that with envy, because we'd all love to be, you know, at that uh, $25 million a film mark, but it can stop you from stepping out and doing more, right? And that's why early success can do it. And same with us as hypnotists and NLPers. These skill sets are freaking magical, right? And also with that, I'll get on my soapbox, it doesn't mean you're magical. You know, it doesn't mean you're, you're anything, but you have a skill set. You've learned hypnosis and NLP, which can create magic in other people. But in our field, going back, especially the bad trainers, they begin to think it's them, not the techniques. Right, so you have to stay hungry. You have to go back and reset, and sometimes you have to new add new skills step by step, right? And then keep doing it. And if you've ever gotten on an airplane back, remember when we could fly, and uh, you're walking when you first get on the the plane, and the door is still open before they lock the door, right? Um, what are the pilots doing? They're going down a checklist. Has that pilot flown that plane before? yeah, at least whatever it is, 2,000 hours or something to sit in the pilot seat. And I forget how many thousands of hours to sit in the co-pilot seat. They're good. Why are they going down a checklist? Because they forget things. It's when they redid medical errors. You know, I have to take medical errors every two years, right, as a psychologist. And they always, part of it, they talk about medicine, how most of the mistakes happen because people didn't check off the simple things, right? So, and don't believe the lie. And what the lie is, sometimes elite trainers will say, I, I, don't, I don't ever think about it. I don't plan anything. 
you know, I love when I was at a conference and there was a guy and he's, after his talk, but he said, oh, that's great. You know, how long did you practice? Oh, I, I never practiced. And I went, well, unless he does the same talk every single time, a lot of people do that. You know, it's you, 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 the people that are good practice, right? So now let's jump into uh, a mat, to me, a master level thing. And again, each trainer, each organization trains a little different. Some do this at the basic level. I don't. I wait to the master level to talk about meta programs. These are the programs that run a little bit deeper. And they kind of, again, it's a default. Do you move toward a goal or away from pain, right? And usually a way is a more fear-based fear, fear -based thing. Or do you move toward a goal? Are you more goal-oriented, right? There's no right, there's no wrong. And it may change by context. But you have a general one you like more than another. Do you move toward a goal or away from pain? And you might have both, but this is an interesting thing to think about because, and let's use the current world thing, this is pretty easy to see in the current world market. What's motivating people? Are they going toward a goal or are they moving away from pain, right? Uh, and there's no right or wrong. It's just like, hmm, the only question is, does it work for you, right? Um, our, one of the things that can happen for us as hypnotists and NLPers, because most, all, all of us had to choose to jump into this. We self-selected into this program to learn hypnosis or NLP. We paid money. Even if you were a psychologist, a social worker, a counselor, unless you go to like, I think there's three professional schools that teach this, they don't, you didn't learn it. You know? So you had, to, you had to opt in. Somehow you moved toward learning it, right? So you learned it, right? And so I, I would say generally, generally in our fear, in, in our field, uh, we move toward goals, right? And so that's why we tell people, you know, when you first start talking to people, you'll, they'll be like, oh, you'll get the, you'll be more goal oriented, right? I always think of when you talk to a smoker and you start talking about all the health benefits, all the good things they'll get and all of this, all that, right? Without finding out what's really motivating the smoker, right? What's really motivating him? Because if he was motivated by health, I would argue he's probably, he, he or she had probably already quit smoking. All right. So maybe it was motivated by, by fear, you know, that their doctor says you have a spot on your lung or they ran up a flight of stairs. I just had last real smoker I worked with was a few months ago and he only called me. He was a hypnotist by the way, but he only called me because he just crossed like the four O mark 40 and he was doing something and had to run up a couple flights of stairs and he had to stop and catch his breath. He never had to do that before, right? And, and the, so he was fear motivated. He goes, my God, I was just sitting there thinking, you know, as he had to stop to catch his breath, that my God, I'm gonna be one of these 60 year olds on, a, on an oxygen machine and I can't play with my grandkids. And I'm like, okay, now I could have went all pro, like, oh, you'll get this, you'll get that. But, you know, or I could use fear, just set him on fire and just up the fear and drive him toward his goal, right? So are you, do you move toward or away from? Great. Are you specific or global? Do you like details or the big picture, right? I always think of this, all my trainers, you get this when people call, you know, and they're asking about your class. How many say, just give me an overview. Just give me the highlights, right? Great. And you can say, well, we'll do this, this, and this. And they just want a very brief overview. Some people go, give me the specifics, right? I still remember, I, every once in a while I have somebody call, so it's a four-day program. What are we gonna be learning on the afternoon of the third day, right? I don't have a clue what you'll be learning on the afternoon of the third day till I start teaching it. I kind of know everything you're gonna learn in the four or five days, but I can just grab my book and go, oh, on the, that day we'll be doing the visual squash, the new behavior generator, and the mending a broken heart. Oh, okay, fine, right? But they want details. But if you tell details to a big picture person, they want to shoot themselves, right? I don't want the details. I just want this, right? You need both, right? Sometimes big picture people are good idea people, good, good drivers of dreams, but they may not follow through. So, so we just kind of have this, right? So when you're talking to people, you know, they, they just kind of know it. Are you internally motivated or externally motivated? Do you do something because it makes you feel good? Or do you do it because what others say or do, right? What's interesting with this one, and right now you can use our current world to, to see this one in action. 
Um, uh, if you go play on Facebook and just look, don't, if you drop your pre-existing ideas and just look, you know, the people posting stuff about this, about the lockdown and all that, you could see how many people are using external motivation to try to get other people to take action. They'll use guilt and shame, which will not really work for an internally motivated person. You know, okay, fine. You know, you could guilt me, but hey, you know, but, or vice versa. And again, I'm not making a judgment. It's just, oh, this is kind of interesting. You know, I've had someone post on my thing. It, it doesn't matter what you feel. Telling that to an internally motivated feeling, a feeling person is insane. Yes, it matters what I feel. You know, I do things because I makes, you know, if I didn't, why would I have wanted at one point in my life to jump out of airplanes and, and slosh around swamps and, and do things like that, right? Uh, why would I want to take an acting class where half the class, they, in one way, they seem to humiliate you and torture you. But it's like, I'm doing it because it makes me feel good when I grow, right? And when I do a really good role, I'll tell you my thing, whether it's a training or whether it's a part, if I think I did a good job, the external, you, you know, it's like the actors that say, I don't read my reviews. And other people go, well, that can't be. Yeah, it can, you know. Just, so you're either internal or external. But if you're talking to someone, if they're your target, if they're your client, which, what motivates them? And, and you tag that in. Are they, are they global? Or are they uh, big picture? Are they specific? Do they need just the overview or do they want the details? And again, is it because they're afraid or are they moving toward, right? And again, it may move. There's, there's no set thing. And lastly, for a lot of what we do, you, might, you want to know, does somebody need to see something one time or many times? What's their evidence procedure? And I always think of this when I had my one clinic going, part of my uh, pre-talk was I would, after I talked to you and gathered the information, I'd say, I'd always say this, I don't have my book here, but it was a, it was a, 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 a three ring binder and it had a whole bunch of testimonials from clients, weight loss, stop smoking, sports, a lot of addictions, um, you know, and so I would say like, um, okay, you know, I, I know you need to think about this, but here's a whole bunch of people, and I'd always do this, just like you, as I'm handing them this, so I'm saying these people are just like you, and I'd already figured out, it, are they internal or external? Are they big picture or detail? Are they moving toward or away from? So let's say I'm handing it to them, and I go, I know these people are just like you. There was a whole bunch that were afraid that if they didn't lose weight, you know, they were going to... And whatever they told me, I would just feed back. You know, they would lose their relationship. They wouldn't be able to walk up the stairs, whatever it is. And, you know, they realized they just, they need some specifics on how to get there because they were that. And maybe like you, they want to get that really good feeling of doing it on their own because they were ex externally motivated. Now, and I'd hand it to them and say, I don't know how many of these you need to read, but I want you to read these until you can convince yourself that this program is for you. And then I'd hand them the, 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 the full, the, the three wing grinder, and I'd say, I got things to do because there were always people in my office. I'd step out of the office, get a cup of coffee, talk to another client. And then when I'd walk in, it was fascinating to me because it was a unofficial research, as I'd always call it. There were some people that, you know, when you looked at the book, they, they'd only like looked at two because a lot of times people would leave it open and it would be on their lap. And I'd look and they'd only read like two right? Two testimonials. And they, they made their mind up, pro or for it. I didn't care whether they were going to take the program or not, but I knew. There were others, they were like a whole bunch in. They needed a lot of evidence, right? And it didn't matter to me, but when I'd walk in and say, so what do you decide, you know? And they'd either say yes or no, but it cut, that was my close. So what'd you decide? And by the way, I'd never mentioned money or programs at this point, but almost all would say, okay, yeah, I want to do it. Then we could figure out what they were going to do. So that's how I would use the meta program and how you could use it. Right. And again, matching their going back to yesterday, visual auditory kinesthetic. Uh, and then I would always figure out what their, what clients needs are. Right. And not Maslow's hierarchy or needs, which, I don't know, I, ugh, I'm not sure that works anymore, but these kind of uh, needs make sense to me, right? Uh, especially for what we're doing, uh, and whether it's a client or a student, 
you know, there are people that want certainty in their lives. There are people that want variety. If you want certainty, right, that, that's the people, right? And again, I'll just keep defaulting to what's going on right now with the shutdown. I don't want to come out till I'm absolutely certain there's no threat ever again. Booyah, right? But it makes sense. And then, but if you want certainty, you're also the type that might stay with a job for 40 years because you get paid the, fir the, the first and the 15th. There's some certainty to it, right? You don't like variety, right? And then there's some people that really love variety. They like things different. Now I'm not, and there's no right, there's no total analog. You're either one way or the other. You may want a very certain job, but then you'll go do a hobby that you play golf. Why do people play golf? That's variety and it's, they don't know what's going to happen when they swing, right? So you go, but what's more important to him, right? And the big one that we're seeing happen right now, do you want significance or do you want connection with other people, right? Some of us love significance. That's why we want to become trainers, speakers, authors, right? Right? We want to do that, right? And so you value being significant, being different you know, standing out? Or do you really want connection, right? And the reason this one's important is you can go after significance so much, you lose all connection, right? You see business people do it. They build a business, right? And it's multi-million dollar business. And then they come home one day and their significant other is, they've moved out. What happened? You were never here, right? Well, I was doing it all for you, right? But were they? They were they were feel you feel significant at work, you know? And then there are other people, they value connections over significance. This is the uh, helicopter parents. They connect to their kids, right? And they, and they start trying to get their significance through their kids, but they get so connected, they lose all their personal significance. Then what happens if that person leaves, their spouse, that's codependency, or if their kids, when they grow up and actually move out, they, that, that connection's gone. Their significance was through that. Now they're lost. So do you, which one of these do you need? Do you like, right? And do you value growth or do you value contribution? You're always going back and forth. So, and, and these kind of things operate at the different levels of the mind. We all know our conscious mind, small portion. I don't know where they come up with the numbers, but it's analytical, rational, short-term, willpower, all that's conscious, right? But when you get down to like these meta programs and these, and your needs, and when we get into waking hypnosis in a moment, you'll see it's all subconscious because this is where your habits, your beliefs, your long-term memories, which is also your values and emotions are underneath the surface. This is what you want to be able to access and help your clients with in other ways. Because what happens, you have that critical factor, right? And it will reject anything that doesn't agree with these deep held subconscious things. You know, I, and again, to, I keep defaulting to the current thing because it's just a classic study in psychology, right? Is people have been posting like, you know, if you post something they don't like, no, that's, you know, uh, show me the science. So you show them the science behind, let's say you clash with them and they'll go, that's not real science, right? Or and I, I'm guilty of it. I will admit that. I'm guilty of it, right? But still, it's like, well, you know, that's why you get the warring experts, right? So you want to be able to bypass the critical factors of the mind, right? And the traditional way is with hypnosis or NLP. And hypnosis uses relaxation and permission to bypass the critical factors, right? Uh, and also uses repetition and compounding, and that'll, that'll bypass it, but it kind of relaxes the critical factor out of the way. NLP uses structure to bypass it, you know, using the hot model. If you, it, it also uses that hot model of hierarchy of thought. Are you in it? You know, are you in the experience? Are you thinking about the experience? Are you thinking, thinking about the experience, right? So you're, you're using that to bypass that. And basically, these kind of techniques don't challenge people's subconscious belief sets, right? So let's jump in now and talk about co conversational and covert NLP and hypnosis, right? And again, you're using naturally occurring states to bypass this, right? You can use confusion to overload. It's basically direct access to emotional states, right? And again, let's use the current wonderful psychological study going on in the world right now. 
how people are, their, their emotions are right here, right? And they're just easily accessed. Most of the time, they're a little bit deeper, right? And, but they're there. And when you get people to access their emotions, they will take actions, right? Because if you, if you figure out what that trigger is, if you figure out what the trigger is and you get them into that emotional state, they'll, they'll take action. It doesn't have to be a negative. It could be a positive state, right? You know, whether it's fear, you know, when you're in fear, you do stupid things. When you're totally in love, you do stupid things, right? Because you're in a highly charged emotional state. And so you want to begin to leverage this conscious subconscious conflict, right? And you amplify it, which creates, if you're into this, cognitive dissonance, right? And then they have to figure it out in their own head, you know? Doesn't mean they'll do exactly what you hope, but there's something going on in their head when you set up cognitive dissonance, right? But it really is about changing first at the subconscious and then letting the conscious mind rationalize it, right? So the change comes this way and then it works. And again, that has to do with the hot model, right? Now, yesterday I talked about the, that rapport trick because everything's still based in rapport where, you know, when you're in rapport with somebody, um, they're much more likely to give you the information that you need and put you in their sphere of influence, right? Uh, and I talked about the rapport trick is when you're meeting someone or a group, if you put yourself into the right state, right? So you imagine somebody you, you like. So if I was meeting somebody for the first time, I could picture my buddy. I said yesterday, my buddy Bill, who I'm just totally comfortable with, I could say anything. I'm comfortable. Da, 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 da. So if I'm in that energy, when I meet you as a stranger, you know, if you're into energy stuff, well, my energy shifted, which is going to open up your energy and all this. And then if I practice the mirroring and the matching, and I'm listening for the visual, the auditory, the kinesthetic, and if we added just what we've done today, if I know you move toward a goal, you're internally motivated and you like the big picture, you know, so I'm talking about how good it'll make you feel. You'll see how easy this works, you know, and we'll all be in this together. Boom, we'll go down a certain path, right? That works great. But there's an advanced technique I, I teach people, which is you need, once you learn that, again, this is the basic learn thing, then you want to learn to differentiate people when you're meeting them right? So if I'm meeting somebody for the first time in a business setting, I may not want to think about my buddy Bill, right? Even though I totally love Bill, trust him, would tell him anything, uh, that may not be appropriate in a business setting, right? Because you wouldn't want to say in the middle of the meeting, what are you, retarded? You know, what are you, stupid? That's not the way it works. I mean, which I would say to my good friend, he could say to me, I wouldn't be offended, right? So you might want to have different people in there. So if I'm talking, if it's a business thing, I got a couple of these set up. So I'm going to think about someone I'm I very comfortable with business, but I would still be, and I hate this term, be a little bit more politically correct, be a little bit more professional, but I'm comfortable with it. So when I meet them, you know, it sets future rapport as opposed to if I'm just, you know, meeting someone for the first time, you know, I'm going to, if it's on a fun level, I'll just think of my buddy Bill or, 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 or Tracy or somebody I'm really comfortable with that I can just have some fun with. That's different than if it's professional, if it's business, you know, because I don't know you yet. I don't want to, I don't want to set, set this relationship on fire, which I've had the tendency to do. That happened in a business thing once I was meeting them and I really stepped into total rapport and it went a little bit too far too quickly. Let's just say that. I'm like, ah, note to self, don't do that crap, right? You know, it worked. Show me how well it worked, right? So again, if you do that and with a group, you know, that with a group, it opens up your energy, right? So have some fun with that. So again, now you want to add levels. If it's fun, if it's a personal one, you could do that, right? If it's business, you want Find people you do business with quite well that you're comfortable with. So now we're going to jump in. I promised you a couple of things. One of my favorite things in waking hypnosis, and it's the easiest, is personal trance words, you know, value-based words. Uh, these are emotionally charged words, right? And again, if I have a rapport with you and I ask you, yeah, hey, what's important to you about this, you know, you'll tell me, you know especially if you add the other magic word of, hey, I'm curious, what's important to you about 
this. They'll tell you, right? Uh, I'll, I'll do a demo real quick. I just, Abner, or not Albert, Albert, not Abner. Albert, unmute yourself. Yes. Okay, this is my friend, Dr. Bermonte, and uh, he's also, it has, we share other passions. Uh, let me ask you a question, Albert, because I'm curious. I'll, this is the whole setup, you know? When you look at uh, doing something, do you do it because it makes you feel good on the inside or what other people say? What's more important? I know we like both. For me, it's a, what, it, what feels good on the inside. Okay, and I, I can appreciate that. By the way, that's a magic word. I can appreciate that. And I'm curious. That's cool. I can appreciate that. So you, it's how you feel on the inside. I can relate. And when you're um, thinking about doing something, do you do it because you want to move toward it? Or, if you, or do you do things because if you don't do it, there's negative? I know we do both, but which one's more important here? Hmm. That's a good question. Because I'm kind of in between there. Oh. It's a little of both then. Yeah, yeah. For me, it's a little bit of both. Okay, that's cool. I can appreciate that. So you move toward a goal, but you don't want to. You don't want to get left out. Right. Right. Okay. Cool. And um, do you need to s see something um, a bunch of times, or just one or two, before you really believe it? I think it's once or twice. Once or twice. Cool. I can appreciate that. All right. And um, when you think about uh, 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 yeah, like if you were finding a new actor, if you were thinking about signing an actor, if an actor and actress is talking to you, uh, you know, what's important to you about a young, and they may not be physically young, you know what I mean, but uh, uh, an actor you may or may not, actress you may or may not take on. Well, important to me is that they got to be passionate about the field. Passionate. passionate. I can appreciate that. Because what good is it without passion, right? Anything else? And I, I guess a good business mindset too, for me, like, because this is a business. So having a good business mindset. Okay. I can appreciate that. And, and, and both my, and all our fields. Anything else when you're like thinking about signing up a new person? Are they open to feedback and change? Okay, cool. Cool. And you know what, just out of curiosity, because I know you started doing Tybo lately, um, what, what's important to you about picking up a new hobby or a new workout? You know, what was important to you about doing something different? Well, that it was the way that the, the particular instructor that I'm you know, using breaks it down. And the fact that it wasn't too complex, like, you know, that I couldn't do, do it, somebody who's a newbie or someone who's not in great physical condition right now was able to still pick up the basic moves. Okay, cool, cool. All right. Okay, well, for all the people watching, I just got, you know, some, some, some buzzwords from Mr. Uh, Albert, right? Passion, business sense, being open-minded to taking feedback. He's internally motivated. Uh, he's kind of balanced on move toward, move away from. And he only needs to see it once or twice, right? And um, those are the big ones. And we could go into, you know, you don't want to get too complex with things at the early level. So now we have that information. We could use it if we wanted to influence Albert to, to do something, you know, uh, or take someone on. Does that make sense to everybody, you know? Yeah, you know, I could say, Albert, you know, I have this friend. She's very passionate about acting. Oh, my God, she loves it so much. And you know what's interesting? She was a very successful salesperson, so she has a business mind. And she's very interested in the business side, not just the acting side, right? And one of the great things, just like in her sales work, she loves feedback because that's how she became a top performer on um, – she was a real estate performer for Remax. That's how she became that, you know? And – you know, and the way she likes that information is broken down because she realizes we're all newbies. Now, I'm not sure if you'd feel good if you took her on, but you know, you don't want to be left, you don't want to lose her to a, to a competing agency, you know, if she's going to be a rising star. So I know she has a demo reel that has one or two of her best works. Would you like to see it? Of course. <laughs> yeah. Sure. And well, it's just, you know, and we could use the same words to get him to do to take action, right? 
And so if you had a client, you could be asking these questions, right? And because the words will kind of transfer, you know, passion, business-minded, and, and, and taking feedback, right? That probably, I'll make a leap here, you know, well, we say we don't use generalities, then I use generalities. We're, these words probably overlap in several areas of his life, you know? Uh, and so again, if you're saying, I'm curious, that's, that's magic, by the way, when you tell somebody, I'm curious about you, because it lowers defense mechanisms, right? And, and when whatever they say, you just agree and say, I could, I could appreciate that. It's magic. Because you're not saying you, you, you just say, I can appreciate it. You know, if you really get along with it, that's great. But if, okay, fine, right? And so these, pa these words, we know in traditional NLP, we could go in and break down, what does passion mean to you? How will you know when you're passionate? You know, what do you mean by business sense? How will you know it? We could get very specific, but if we're just going to gather general information, we just get the words and then use them, right? So this stuff is like magic. And if you got rapport and you're, you, you, if, and you know whether they're visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, and we add that, I did go in and get his, you know, he, he's internally motivated, he's kind of balanced on the toward or away from, and he only needs to see things a couple of times. I didn't do global or specific. Um, and that's how traditional personal trans words work, because usually in traditional, like uh, entry-level therapy, hypnosis, NLP, we usually stay, for, stay away from sometimes deeply held beliefs like politics, religion, money. But in this kind of area, we at least get the words to what they represent because that's, that it, I always use the term, it lights up your neurology, right? And of course, to do this, you have to be able to set aside your beliefs and use theirs when you're doing it. And again, this is one sounds, sounds easy. It's easy when those beliefs align with yours it may not be easy when they clash with yours, right? But you want to be simper gumby here, simper gumby, always flexible, right? Don't just be flexible. And it's fun stuff, right? And you can, you can have fun with this, right? And, and we just did the, uh, the example. And I always said, I can appreciate that. Oh, I understand that. Right? And I, I don't use understand because then I'm, it, to me, that's a different word in my head, but appreciate just means I can appreciate that. You know, it's like when people ask me about other NLP trainers, my, my default is I'm a fan of their work. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it's like, Hey, they're working. I mean, you know, it's like, Hey, I'm a, you know, and generally it's visual and then kinesthetic, but you want to have some fun with this. So begin to think about that. Right. And again, We've got a great real-time psychological experiment going on all over the world where people are laying bare these personal trans words, right? And it's interesting to watch, right? So uh, I promised a couple of things, and today it'll be a little faster. Uh, we're going to do an easy-to-use, little-known uh, or taught, by the way, way to bypass the critical factors mind to do two things. First, because yesterday when I did the, uh, the basic and I did the uh, mapping across something you like to something you dislike or, you know, love to discuss to get you to like to drop a food, um, which, by the way, that technique uh, is why I'm still doing NLP after 38 years or 40 years, whatever it is, 40 years. Um, why? Well, I always tell this story, and this one's been standard, which is uh, I was at an NLP conference, and or not a conference, a demo back in the day, and the, the person doing the demo, Michael Banks, said, does anybody here have a food they want to give up? Well, nobody raised their hand. So then he goes, well, does anybody want to eat a food? And I said, yeah, I'd like to eat more fruits, vegetables, I don't, or especially fruit. I don't eat fruit. And I remember right when I said it, somebody in the room went, that's stupid. I still remember that. And I'm like, well, that's not rapport. You know, I, he talked a little bit about rapport. And that just, you know, it's like, because fruit's good for you. I knew that, you know, I was a bodybuilder. I, I do martial arts, you know, I, uh, I'm an actor. You know, I try to, try to take care of myself, all the other things that I am, but I just didn't like fruit. So he goes, well, come on down. We'll get you like fruit. He goes, let's pick it a fruit. I said, an apple. I hadn't eaten an apple in years at that point. Right. And then he goes, well, what's the food you really like? And I said, Cinnabons. 
And, and he goes, okay, he didn't make a judgment. And then he kind of like what we did yesterday. First, he had me describe Cinnabon, something I love. And I, they're right there. They're about that big. They're, it's got the cream cheese frosting with the cinnamon and it's running down. It's, it's warm, gooey. It's like that. It's kind of moving in this three dimensional thing. It's just, oh, and I get them. Num, num, num. I feel good to this day. I love Cinnabons, right? There's none around me, so I don't get to eat them too often, but it's like right there. You know, at one point I used to know where they were in every airport when they were still in airports. Uh, but anyway, so there it is. Great. And then he said, now think of an apple. I said, well, an apple is down left, way down there. They're gooey, slimy, gray, mushy, right? And common sense would say, well, I'm not going to eat that apple. Those are my submodalities. So he had me move the apple up to where the cinnamon was. And he kind of kept using these words like, let the magic happen. It doesn't have to make sense. But that apple will become colorful and bright. It didn't become warm and gooey and covered in frosting. But a couple of days later, I'm sitting, standing there, and I'm eating uh, uh, and talking to Christina. And uh, I opened the refrigerator, and she had apples in there. And I took an apple, and I start eating it as we're talking. And she's giving me one of these. I go, what? I thought I did something wrong. She goes, you're eating an apple. And I remember, I went, yeah, of course, I love it. It freaked me out, right? And she goes, I've never seen you eat an apple. And then a couple of days later, I was at my mom's. And I walked in eating an apple. She freaked out, right? Because she goes, I couldn't get you to eat fruit when you were a kid, right? And so now it's all these years later, I still eat fruit. A lot of you have seen me in trainings. I eat a lot of fruit, right? So that's, that works. You can do the mapping across. So that's what I did yesterday. So, but what about if you need to, what if you don't want to totally give something up, but you want to moderate it? Interesting question, right? Interesting question. Uh, can you moderate certain things? I think you can, right? And map across. But first, and this is where the master level comes in, you need to find some naturally occurring things in that, in your client's life that they naturally mod moderate right? They might have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. They might not, right? This is where, because when I start talking about this, I only teach this at the master level or above because then people want to do it for, oh, they're, I'm going to do that with a smoker. I, I don't think it'll work with a smoker, right? I, 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 I've seen too many evidence to the contrary. A friend of mine quit smoking down here a couple of times. And the last time he quit for a couple of years. And then he starts smoking cigars because I can moderate cigars. I remember him telling me, Right? It wasn't a client, just somebody I knew. And I'm like, I don't think this will end well, right? And he went back to smoking cigarettes, right? He never moderated cigarettes. So the, I think that pathways kind of get hardwired into his head. I don't know. That's a philosophical debate. But let's say there's something that, yeah, maybe they eat a little bit too much sugar, but they're not really addicted, but they want to moderate it. You know, they don't want to be like a food Nazi. So you could find something. What's something in your life? that you can take or leave, do or not do. No big deal. What is something like that? You know, and if they said like, oh, you know, like broccoli, if I show up and they have broccoli out like at a, uh, at a, you know, like a, if you're at a party and they put out one of those trays, I might have some, I might not, no big deal, right? So can you take it or not take it, leave, whatever it is, you know? Has there ever been something in your life that you grew out of, that you used to love? Now you're like, nah, it's not that big a deal. I found this pretty cool with uh, people because especially here in the Western world where when they're a little kid, they love the super, super sweet candies and, 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 and um, cereals and stuff. And then it's just like they kind of grow out of it. You don't like it anymore. And again, it's going to tie into what we're going to do in a moment. So if you want to help somebody moderate, the big thing would be there has to be something in their life that they, can't, that they already naturally moderate right? Uh, and then maybe you could take it, let's say they thought they were drinking or their doctor told them they're drink. I did this with somebody, they're drinking too much coffee. And I'm like, hmm, what can I, what can I use, right? They didn't want to totally give up coffee because they go, yeah, every once in a while they want to be out, maybe, you know, after dinner, have a cup of coffee with friends, whatever. I'm like, okay. So I'm sitting there thinking, thinking, and I'm, I ask them and they go, well, you know, it was, um, Iced tea. For some reason, the, this person chose iced tea. I said, what about iced tea? He goes, you know, sometimes I'll have it on a hot day. Other days, no, I'll just have water. I can take it or leave it. It's no big deal to me. I don't go out of my way to get it. That was the key. That's what I was driving for. I'm like, okay. So we took the coffee and made it just like his iced tea, you know? And on a follow-up, 
it seemed to work well. He goes, yeah, I'll have a cup of coffee here and there, you know. Uh, and he began and he began to moderate it. And again, you know, I I don't I wouldn't do this with uh, like cigarettes or alcohol or drugs. But there's a lot of things if you can moderate it, yeah. And again, if you could find a naturally occurring thing that they moderate or something they've grown out of, then you can maybe get them to do it, All right? So that's 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 the driver. At this level, you start letting you start accessing your target or your client's mind to find out is there something in there that they've done before that you can put this into. And this ties into the flip technique, which is one of my favorites. Now, what the flip technique is, you have a place in your mind where things used to be true, but now is not. You used to drive a certain car, now maybe you drive this other car, right? You used to live. I used to live in Indiana, now I live in Florida, right? And again, it used to be true. I lived in Indiana. I could still, I could picture it right there. It is. It's not true anymore. So it's in a different place in my mind. It's no longer true for me. This is important. It's no longer true for me. You know, that's, you know, uh, or I used to be in a relationship with this person. Now I'm not. And, and it's not making a judgment on it. It's just that place where it's no longer true for me. Right. And you have a place in your mind where things are true for you right now. I do this right now. I live here. <clears throat> you know, we're currently in lockdown. These things are true for me now. And here's an important one I've added recently. Many people, not all, but many people have a place in their mind for certain behaviors that no way. What's a behavior that no way I would do, right? Uh, and and this is a personal thing. Usually when I, if I get to this level and I'm asking somebody, I don't want them to tell me because they'll go politically correct. Oh, I'd never do this. I would never, do, I would never, you know, harm an animal or do that. All that I, I hope is true. But what's a, you need something that you would literally suffer at the, at, at the, at the level of pain, maybe death before you did it. What's a no way, right? Now, if I know these things in your mind, if you know there's a place in your mind that used to be true as now is not, now you have a place in your mind which these are true for you right now, this is true for you right now, and if somewhere in your mind you have a place of no way, that's no, that's no way, right? And close to that little area is a little area called, that's, that's not who I am anymore. Mm -hmm. I've grown out of that. That's not who I am anymore, right? You know, if you ask me about drinking, it's not who I am anymore. You know, I just messaged somebody from my high school, and uh, they still remember me as, you know, the guy that had to join the Army because <laughs> of my drinking. Uh, but, you know, it's like, and I just, all I just calmly said was, that's just not who I am anymore. That's a no way. Drinking to me is now a no way, you know, because people go, is there, no. I, know, I can't think of one. So now let's say if I want to work with, excuse me, my eye just if I'm working with somebody and they're making a change, what if you take the thing that they want to get rid of, right? Or they're moderating, right? And, and put it into the area that it used to be true and now it's not. Like I used to drink too much iced tea. Now I don't. I can take it or leave it, right? And now when you think about, I'm the kind of person that can take it or leave it, that's true for me now. And you have them put that in that spot of their mind. If you need, you could put the thing about no way. I, I save that one for strong things that they want to give up, right? But you begin to use these naturally occurring pathways in their mind, right? There's these naturally occurring pathways in the mind, right? So let me stop the share, open this up. There we go. And we'll get ready to do I wanna I want you to I want you to listen to something real quick though. Um hold on. Um I want you to just sit back for a moment. And you know, you're an intelligent, articulate person, and the kind of person that studies the mind. And I find that fascinating. And I can appreciate that because I love studying about the mind, right? And you know what I'd like you to do? I'd like you to think about 
someone you respect and admire, maybe the people that brought you into hypnosis or NLP, or maybe even their teachers, because hopefully your teacher had a teacher, your master has a master. So just think about that and how easily you feel so good when you're thinking about this person, how they made you feel. And I want you to just to think about uh, what they gave you, you know, maybe some of the talents, abilities, and skills, techniques, things like that, right? And so as you think about those things, you easily and effortlessly think about the great things that you can do. And you think about the great things you're going to do in the future. And you know, even though we're sitting here on Zoom, I want you to know, I mean, really know, you know the difference between know in the head and know in the heart? What if you could know in the head and know in your heart? And just think about that. And as I look into your eyes, it's almost like even through Zoom, I'm looking into your soul because I invite you to look into mine because I know that you, like me, want to learn more. And, you know, generally, most of my life is an open book, you know. Uh, so it's just something to think about. Now, let me click this down. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, sorry. Anyway, that's what we'll be talking about tomorrow when I get into the uh, how to do uh, waking hypnosis with groups. That's the trainer stuff. That's tomorrow's uh, little uh, review. Um, so anyway, uh, that's kind of evil, especially the thing, as I look into your soul and you into my, <laughs> I love this stuff. Because uh, the more I learn, the less I know, right? And uh, so, you know, because in martial arts, they always say, you know, when you see an old guy that takes martial arts or girl, right? Uh, you can tell the real ones because their black belt is turning white, mm -hmm. Right, because they keep tying it and untying it and they wash it and it breaks down and it becomes, you know, and usually a new black belt likes their black belt. And then after you've been doing it for a couple of decades, it's like falling apart and it, it almost looks like a white belt, right? And in the, old, in the old school, they used to talk about, well, you want that because you got to realize you're always a beginner. You're always, you're, you're always a beginner at something, right? And so <clears throat> just something to think about. So. That is the kind of a refresher of the master level stuff of NLP. It's always my joy to teach it. Uh, does anybody have any <clears throat> questions, comments? Oh, I know what I was going to do as people are thinking about that. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, I'm doing one thing while we're doing this, if I can. Uh... Okay, does anybody have a question, comment? No. Who? Oh, Albert. Yes, Mr. Albert, Dr. Bermonte. Okay, um, so I'm... I, I've started like sometimes when I'm meeting with an actor, trying to figure out their visual, like their their system, you know, the auditory, visual, kinesthetic. The problem that I have is that I was running into is that I felt like because I was concentrating so much and looking that it took me out of the interview a little bit, okay. like out of the, it didn't feel organic anymore. Like I almost felt like I was losing what they were saying because I was looking for their language pattern what they're trying to do. So I guess how to pull back, but also at the same time, you know, figure out their, their system. Or maybe there's a type of questions I can ask that will automatically give that to me. Like oh. whether they're auditory, visual, kinesthetic. So I can start using that back to them. And how do, I guess I put also in the chat box is how do you, how could I elicit, you oh, know, yeah. an initial interview with it, especially like a 20, no, one, no field actor their personal transfers oh okay good question well one thing is you always ask them about things besides acting right because that they're going to say the passion and all the crap yeah. that we're, we're kind of taught to say yeah, right? yeah, yeah. but ask them about other things kind of hobbies skills this or that right and then you'll get those personal transfers popping up um and 
and I know you don't want to hear the next part, but you take feedback, <laughs> uh, which is some of it you just got to practice and, and some of it you, you want to be able to flip between the conscious competence and the unconscious competence. Yes. You're kind of always kind of hovering back and forth and just, just keep, you're, you're getting there. But I think you also fall into like a lot of us where you begin to think people know what you're doing and they don't have a clue. Yeah. They don't have a clue. So just keep doing it. You're doing great. All right. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yes, ma'am. Miss. Uh, Sumati. Yes, Mate. Yeah. I, I enjoyed the flip, the moderating, moderating, and then the flip part of it. That was something new. I'm here. I'm listening to you after probably 20 years, and it's a, it's a great joy. The idea of the you know some place, the three types of place is something very nice. Has this been included in the master's program? Yes. Great. That's a, that's I enjoyed that. Thank you so much for uh, the well structured way of shared today. Cool. Thank you, Mr. Bob in Los. The, in Southern California, not in, Los in Angeles. In Southern California, and I've been here on and off for a lot of years, including with LAPD. And like you, I also was in the military. So, you you mentioned about doing a checklist, and and I think that's very very important. Do you do you teach, especially at the at the master's level? the trainers on, on how to use a uh, checklist and otherwise, or, or, or is it part of what, what you do as well? It, it's just part of what I do. I got to keep it in my mind. Yeah. I'm adding that, how to use a little checklist. And part of that, I think we get into this where, you know, it's one reason. Here's one of the reasons I do what I do. If you ever see me demo at a conference, right? And a lot of you have, you'll always see me grab the book when I'm going to do a technique. Right. I know Elizabeth seen it. Albert seen it. Bob seen it. Mark. Right. I would dare my arrogance would dare say I pretty much know the technique I'm going to teach. The reason I sit there and hold this and two reasons. A is I do have a tendency to kind of wing it. Right. But B is I want the students to subconsciously pick up that it's OK to look at a checklist. It's OK to look at a technique. Right. Because if not, they're going to want to model, you know, Jerry Kine after 35 years of doing babble, as he called it. Oh, I should just be able to do that. Well, why? You don't have 35 years, right? And, and again, too, every time I've made a mistake, it's, if you want to call it a mistake, it's I didn't go down the list. You know, it also reminds me if I'm teaching, especially this is for my teachers, this is kind of for tomorrow, right? If I'm in the middle of a technique with somebody doing a demo and the need arises to go astray, right? Because whatever, the technique's not working. So we're going to go off and do this. I can, I can note where it is and then tell the group why I did what I did, which is a better teaching example than, you know, uh, uh, just doing it and then expecting people to get it, right? Uh, I tell people after, how can I say this? After you've been in this field a few years, especially if you've really studied NLP and hypnosis, then it's a good time to go watch Richard Bandler or John Grinder. I wouldn't suggest it at the beginning. That's just my own opinion, right? Because he kind of free forms it and he's doing this, he's doing that. If you know what he's doing, it's brilliant. Right. But I've seen people go there and then kind of want to, it's kind of like watching Tony Robbins. If you've, if you've trained in this and you watch him, what he does is very structured. That's very, there's a whole structure to it. It's brilliant. Uh, da, 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 da. But if you don't, you just think again, people start thinking it's the magic instead of it's a magical technique. So it's a good question. Thank you. Well, yeah, I know that uh, I'm going to piggyback on that. Because we both went to jump school and we had a checklist on, on that as well. Yeah, it kind of helps if you have a backup parachute. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. What's the joke they always say? You know, guys going there, jump sergeant, jump sergeant. 
what happens, you know, if I pull my rip cord and it, or, you know, when I jump out, cause you're, you're ringed. If I jump out and the op main chute doesn't open, how long drill, jump sergeant do I have for my, for me to pull my emergency chute? They probably did this when you were there. They spit the rest of your life, son. <laughs> <laughs> That may be a very short period of time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but trust me, it'll go fast. <laughs> so, sorry. Tough crowd. I'm here on Thursday. Tell your friends. <laughs> cool. All right. All right. Let me ask Miss Monica a question. Good morning. Hey, Miss Monica in beautiful... Uh, Minnesota, um, when because you're uh, and I know there's other people in here they have too. But when you've watched like Bandler work, um, after <coughs> at, since you understand some of the basics, didn't it give you some insight to how he was doing what he was doing? It made it a lot more fun, um, and for picking up a lot more of the nuances that you'd otherwise miss if you've never seen it done before or know like the language structures and um how he's getting what he's getting it makes for for what you're spending it it helps uh foster the investment you could say cool cool all right okay who does anybody else have a question I got one to answer in the. In the thing. Anybody? No questions, comments? Okay. Nobody? Nobody? Jesus, tough crowd. No? All right. Oh, Mr. Bob, um, um, there you go. You're unmuted. Well, just to follow up on that comment you were saying, we had a gentleman at a, a, a small organization we have here in New Jersey who would give uh, talks, and he he learned his NLP from Bandler and um, oh John something or other. I can't think of his name. Um, but in any event, he would do talks, and having have ha, having a background in NLP. I, under, I understood what he was doing, but I truly didn't understand it. It was just like all over the place. But I, I, I sort of saw generally what he was doing. But the other people that were there that didn't even have the background I have just said, what the hell was he doing? Didn't understand it at all. It was like, why was I here tonight? Yeah, that's, yeah. Well, and that's the other thing. Um, uh, I th well, we'll talk about it tomorrow at the refresher of the trainer's course is the launch to the master trainer's course. Not that anybody would want to join the master trainer's course. Uh, but the, uh, is, it's easy to want to jump in and teach the, the fancy stuff and not just keep and let, because you got to gauge your audience, right? You got to gauge your audience. Uh, and I always use my example of a few people have met him. Um, there's a guy down here when that teaches trapeze, and uh, it's a certain skill set to be able to do what this man does. And what he can do is I've seen him there. You know, I'll bring a class uh, when I when I was having a live class down. We'd go over and we'd all fly on the trapeze. It's a blast, right? And uh, so there's people who've never been on the trapeze, and this guy will work with you. Uh, he'll coach you up to fly on the trapeze. It, it's fun, right? No problem. And then this almost right after that, and I've seen this, so that the class is wrapping up and then, then he's, uh, he's got some professionals coming in, professional trapeze flyers from the circus that are there to polish an act or to learn a new trick, or usually it's to hone an act because maybe they got a new catcher or a new, anyway, that's too much detail for you. But so he's working with the best of the best. These are people that used to be on Ringling. Ringling's gone now, but they're still, they're the ones that fly in Europe and South. These people are good. So he just worked with somebody that's never even seen a trapeze. Now he's stepping in and I'm, he's going to work with these elite level people. 
that's a skill set. That's one reason I used to take trainers there. I go, watch this guy, because not everybody can do that. And don't beat yourself up if you can. There's some people that are great at teaching the basic level, and they can't teach the advanced stuff. And then there are some people that can teach the advanced stuff brilliantly, brilliantly, but they can't go back and teach the basic stuff, right? To use the sports analogy, there are some coaches I've heard, uh, Belichick being one, is he teaches this level stuff. He's up here. He has assistants to teach this stuff, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. So it's kind of like, okay, this makes sense to me, right? And I'm pretty good at it, but you know, you have to develop that. But it's uh, to go back to, to what Bob said there in beautiful New Jersey is you got to realize where your audience is too. Cause I see people do that at conferences. They're trying to teach this really slick basic stuff or tr fast stuff and they lose 90% of your audience. All right. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. All right. I'm respectful of everyone's time. I'd like to thank you all. I will post this. Again, my um, uh, emails, Dr. Will Horton, D-R-W-I-L-L-H-O-R-T-O-N at gmail.com. Uh, uh, and also on the web, look up the website, NFNLP. And if you want, uh, I'll be posting this later today, maybe tonight. Um, and this recording with the PowerPoint, I'll go back yesterday's recording and put in yesterday's PowerPoint with it. Or just shoot me an email and I'll send you that PowerPoint. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining. Um, and I shall, as we say, excuse me, see you all as we trudge the road to happy destiny. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow.